Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. If everybody could please stand, and we'll start with a blessing by Father Micah. Thank you for coming. Let us place ourselves in the presence of God. We begin in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, on this Feast of the Blessed Trinity, we thank you for being our God and we being your people. We thank you for the graces you have given us in the past and we ask you to continue blessing us in the future. Please bless our family, our friends, living and dead. Please bless us in what we are about to learn this evening. And we pray that the Lord your Son thought us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. All right, well, I'm not tall. I'm not wearing a cassock. I'm obviously not Deacon Sabatino. Um, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Melanie Baker, and I'm the Associate Director of the Institute. Deacon Sabatino is actually back at home for his daughter's dance recital. So I get to fill in and stage a coup and, and take over for the Institute. Um, so without further ado... Welcome back, Father Shank. Thank you, Melanie. God be praised on this marvelous day in which we contemplate the mystery of the Holy Trinity. I'm speaking for the Latin right now. And the reason is because the Melkite eparch, when he learned that I was an Anglican, he said, oh, the Anglican men, go to the Latin Archbishop first. And if he lets you come to us, then you can. So I didn't know I belonged at that time. As an Anglican, I belonged to a Catholic bishop. But I found out I did. Uh, the Cardinal Archbishop of Baltimore, I belonged to him. I, I, I felt like a, an adoptee who suddenly learned who his spiritual birth father was. And I found out I belonged to my archbishop. It was a very, very a heartwarming discovery. Once again, uh, we are in our journey with St. Peter. And I hope that this has been an exciting and enlightening journey for you. I find walking with the holy apostles uh, to be just some of the most exhilarating drama, uh, the most interesting, inspiring really riveting literature, the stories that come to us from these extraordinary, ordinary, uh, now I'm not, uh, I'm not exploring the uh, philosophical extents or bioethics or Catholic social teaching, I'm using it in just the colloquial uh, way we do. These are just extraordinary, ordinary folks who um, are models to us in our time in living for Christ. We have a lot to cover. Now, I've given you the outline for Second Peter, uh, which is partaking of or in the divine nature. I, uh, I won't sue for infringement. I don't believe in that. So by all means, make a copy. This is our outline as we embark upon the second epistle of Peter, the second encyclical, but we're not there yet. We have to go back a little bit into First Peter tonight 
So um, don't be looking for the notes for the first third of our time together. They're not in that booklet. We're not there yet. What I want to do, because I am so, so inspired by the great work that the Institute is doing in the new evangelization, and I boast about you now everywhere I go, I'd like to support the Institute. I'm learning tonight for the first time that you're in your fundraising drive. So what I'd like to do tonight to contribute to the Institute is for all who will sign up tonight for a monthly gift, small or large, we'll put them in a till tonight and at the very end to mix them all up and you pick one and you get a copy of the reverse interlinear internet-based interlinear tool. It's $58 uh, retail, um, but retail not for you. Uh, so a $40 gift. So this one is for the Institute. All right. So let's return now to the third chapter of First Peter. We're not to Second Peter yet, though we must get there. We're going, to, uh, we're going to move there with deliberate speed, but nevertheless with requisite caution and carefulness so that we cover what we need to cover in the first encyclical of Peter. And remember, if you were here last week, that I left you hanging on a question. Does anyone remember what that question was? But I left you with this question, and that is, what has the flood of Noah, the great deluge from Genesis, what has that to do with the Exodus, the Agada, remember we talked about that, or the Passover, which is the centerpiece of the Haggadah? Why does Peter introduce Noah's flood and the ark? What connection is there? Well, the great Hebrew Bible translator, Everett Fox. Doesn't sound like a great Hebrew Bible translator, does it? Everett Fox sounds like a commentator on Fox News <laughs> or something like that. Everett Fox has produced, God rest his soul, just the finest, most vivid, marvelous translation of the Torah, the five books of Moses, called the five books of Moses. <laughs> and uh, so, I know, surprising, isn't it? You must find it. The most vivid, penetrating translation of the Hebrew language available. His intent was to do the whole Bible, the Tanakh, the whole Old Testament, but died, sadly, just after he finished the five books of Moses. So you find that by Everett Fox, but it is his insight into the exposition of the Hebrew that makes this connection, and you'll see it just in a moment. So the stage is set for the flood by means of a powerful sound reference. In Genesis 5.29, Noah was named. He's called there by his name ostensibly to comfort his elders' sorrow over human pains in tilling the soil. Remember the curse on the land? And because they're in drudgery, his name is called Noah. And, and I know I'm leaving you a little bit baffled here, but there's going to be a precise statement in Fox in just a second. So he quotes... Genesis 5.29, and here it is, in his vivid translation, he called his name Noah, exclamation point, saying, Ze yen yamahunan, this one comfort our sorrow from our toil, from the pains of our hands coming from the soil, which, and he transliterates here the tetragrammaton, the yod heh vav the, the four-letter sacred name of God. And so we just substitute that with Adonai in Hebrew, the word Lord. Here in Genesis 6.6, 6, however, the meaning of Noah's name has been ironically reversed. 
the one supposed to bring comfort only heralds God's own being sorry and pained. Genesis 6, 6 through 7. And here's the quote. Then Adonai was sorry that he had made humankind on earth and it pained his heart. A similar ironic wordplay where the audience knows what the name bestower does not occurs in Exodus 2.3. Curiously, the hero of that passage, the baby Moses, is also connected with an ark, the term for the little basket in which he is set adrift, and I might add, the water which saves him and ultimately all of Israel. Moses' little ark, what, floating on the water. So, does Peter know this? Does Peter know this linguistic twist from the Hebrew Bible that subtly but very ingeniously connects the ark of Noah floating on the water saving humanity with the ark of Moses floating on the water that saves Israel. That's the Haggadah. That's the whole Passover tale. That's what it begins with. Without Moses in what? You thought it was a basket, didn't you? No, it was an ark. And Moses in the ark, there's no Passover. There's no Haggadah. There's no tail lying behind Peter's letter without that ark carrying Moses, who saves Israel. So I thought that was just fascinating. There's a the little asterisk, something that you can tell at your Passover Seder when all your friends and family are at home. Okay? So we move on now to uh, verses 13 through 17 of First Peter. Goodness gracious, we must move with haste. 3, 13 through 17. Let's read it. Now, who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will than to suffer for doing evil. Now, let's begin just with a general statement that those who suffer unjustly imitate Christ. They are not to fear and not to sin when they suffer. He also tells them always to be ready to give an answer to those who ask them about their hope. Now, here is more Pascha language. Check out Exodus chapter 13, verses 14 through 16. Exodus 13, 14 through 16. I'll just give you the reference there. But remember this, at the Passover Seder, how many have been to a Seder? All right, good number of you. You remember this, right? You remember that? Why is tonight unlike all other nights? And here, Moses tells the Israelites, when your son, you sit down for the Passover and your son asks you to explain the ritual, this is what you tell them. So always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you, Peter says, echoing this kind of interrogatory that lies behind Peter's thinking and his Passover Haggadah. All right, so... 1 Peter 3, 16, and then 21. Let's just read verse 21. We jump ahead. 
And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, Peter introduces here, in the third chapter, the concept of human conscience. Peter introduces a somewhat novel and even radical idea that is critical to understanding identity, reconciliation, and salvation. The idea, that concept is found in verse 16 and verse 21. The Greek term is senedesis, conscience. It is literally knowledge alongside. Knowledge alongside. The Aramaic word is teretaya, teretaya, from the old Hebrew word ta'or, ta'or. So here's this string of words. The Hebrew ta'or, the Aramaic teretaya, and then comes over into the Greek as synodesis. Oh, I want to throw in an Ethiopic word, too. <laughs> okay. Tarir. And this means to be moved from instinct. Now, we're going to unpack this here for a moment. Uh, by the way, I call Ethiopic, uh, which they call Gies, as the perfect biblical language the liturgical language of the Ethiopian church, both the Orthodox and the Ethiopian Catholic church. The liturgical language is Giz, we call it Ethiopic, perfect biblical language, Semitic vocabulary in Greek letters. Just perfect. Can you get better than that? Okay. So when I was sitting down with the um, with the eparch of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, who, I, who I've known very well, Abba Malkitzedek. It's just melodic. It just flows off the tongue. Abba Malkitzedek. And uh, I asked him, uh, when we were sitting together at a meal, uh, I, I, uh, I t turned to him and I said, Atamavin Ivrit? And he, he laughed like St. Nicholas. <laughs> do, you, do you understand Hebrew? Yes, of course I understand Hebrew. Why? Because we've been speaking it for 4,000 years. So, uh, so uh, but then you could talk to him in Greek too because he had all compact in one. Uh, one language, Greek and, and Hebrew. All right, so... Now, let's go back to Peter for a moment, who wasn't Ethiopian. Among the country folk in Galilee, the philosophical idea of conscience was not very well developed. In Judea, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, did not include this idea until very late. Rather, the Old Testament refers to interiority, the interior life, as resident in organs of the body, the heart, leb. It's a very, very powerful seat. And that's come to us even to this day, right? You have a real heart for something, right? That really broke my heart. Well, that comes directly from the Old Testament. That's not just some saying that came out of nowhere. That derives directly because leb, in Hebrew, the heart is the seat of the interior life, but also the kishkas, the kidneys. In fact, the Talmud says there are two kidneys. Do you know why? Because one provokes you to good things and the other to bad. Right? So now you know. Now you know. You have biblical warrant to say, my bad kidney. <laughs> uh, but that wasn't a Jewish idea. That came from Egypt, but never mind. Okay. From the first century B.C., now the Greek word, synedasis, or synedas, the neutral participle that's used as a noun, are used synonymously in both pagan and Hellenistic Jewish writings. 
synedos, synedesis, synedos, just using two different forms of the word, is first used by Demosthenes in the uh, fourth century BC. And he uses it as a faculty of memory. Originally, it appears to refer to the capacity to relate to oneself, especially looking back on one's past, evaluating the factors that led to good or evil. Depending on whether a man can justify himself, he is said to have a good, agathe or orte, or a bad, dine or ponera, conscience. He has a good conscience or a bad conscience upon reflection. The Greeks tended to speak of a bad conscience. That was kind of the dominant idea. But later the Romans would develop this and speak of the contentia bona, the good conscious, the consentia preclara, the clear conscience, or even the consentia optima, the best conscience. Now, the Old Testament had no particular term, as I said, for the phenomenon of conscience. In the Septuagint, remember I told you about the Septuagint? That's the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament. Very, very important for us because it was the preferred translation of the church for the first four centuries of Christianity. And it was the Septuagint that introduces the word senedas, but only three times. In um, Ecclesiastes, chapter 10 and verse 20, in Wisdom, chapter 17 and verse 11, and in Sirach, chapter 42 and verse 18. Now, there's a difference between the Hebrew and the Greek. The Old Testament stresses the attitude of man towards God as his biggest dilemma. But in the Greek, in the Hellenistic world, it was man's difficulty understanding himself. Now, in classical Greek, synodesis refers to knowledge, especially knowledge based on an examination of past deeds. A person known for doing good deeds is said to have a good conscience, as the Hebrew scriptures concern the covenant between the people of Israel and God, there is not a concept of this interior life per se in the Jewish tradition. The ancient Israelite prophets did call on individuals to act ethically, but this meant keeping to the law given by Moses, or given by God rather, through Moses, and close monitoring of the law acted as a surrogate conscience. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34 says, For the Lord, a new covenant will be written on the hearts of the people, but this passage does not imply self-reflection. The closest phrase, perhaps, is what we have in the Latin office for Friday, for morning prayer, Psalm 51 where David praised the Lord for a clean heart and a new and right spirit within me. So now we're closing in with David's psalm on this idea of self-examination and of a clear or clean conscience. Now, Sirach 42.18, however, employs the word edesein, I called it earlier, synedesein, the same word. Just missing a prefix, never mind, we don't need to go into it. But employs this word, conscience, in a Hebrew parallelism. Now, the Hebrew parallelism is a literary device in which you say the same thing twice for emphasis, but you use a different vocabulary. So, in Sirach 42.18, we have the word edesein, which is the Greek, which we translate conscience, in a Hebrew parallelism with abuson, the abyss, the abyss, A-B-Y-S-S. All right, so now we have a parallel between the word for conscience and the word for a deep abyss. Now, I find some illumination on this from St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, Edith Stein, who wrote about the deep 
inner recesses of the soul, the inner man, as St. Paul puts it, the place where good and evil, right and wrong, hope and despair are sorted through and sorted out. She called it the I. I. And I quote, that in the soul by which she possesses herself and that which moves within her as in its own space. The deepest point is at the same time the place of her freedom, the place at which she can collect her entire being and make decisions about it. The conscience, then, is the inner process of discerning between good and evil. It is not, however, the authority which determines good and evil. That authority, according to the prophet Jeremiah, is the law of the Lord written upon the heart, the leb. So now you see these two ideas. The Hebrew idea, which was my relation to God and his law. That operated as the conscience. And then the Greek idea, which was more turned inward, the relationship between man and himself. Now, as we grow in this understanding, the idea that Peter introduces here, and albeit now, let's, let's give credit where credit is due. St. Paul speaks a great deal about the operation of the conscience. I'm not ruling him out, uh, but I'm not so sure either that Paul and Peter were necessarily tweeting or texting or emailing or, for that matter, this, this is ancient times, telephoning one another. Uh, I don't think it worked that way. So I'm looking at this as Peter, the Galilean, the Aramaic thinker, now he's beginning to unpack this concept of the depth of the interior life and he's introducing this in a very fresh way to the readers of his first encyclical. I think it's powerful. And I wanted to stop there for a moment just to go into a, another asterisk that we can see how important this letter is for his readers because he's educating on the one hand the Greeks to bring them over and say conscience is very important but it is not the chief authority. God's law is the chief authority. And he's saying to the Hebrew thinkers, to his Jewish readers, he's saying to them, God's law and your relationship to it, yes, but there is a place for you to examine within yourself and know yourself, if you will, in relation to that law. So he's bringing the two concepts, which were somewhat mutually exclusive to one another, He's bringing them together into this synthesis, which I think is so powerful and so important. And this is where we have the cooperation between the Aramaic Hebrew heart and mind and the Greek language and learning. Now we'll move on because we have to finish up. Verses 18 through 22, I'll just call your attention to that. You can read it afterward. But here I did want to bring out in verse 19 that Peter introduces the church's belief in the descent of Christ into hell, a manifestation of the fact that salvation reaches all, irrespective of the age in which they live. The Catechism of the Catholic Church on this point, number 637, says, in his human soul, united to his divine person, the dead Christ went down into the realm of the dead he opened heaven's gates for the just who had gone before him. And the compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 125, says this hell was different from the hell of the damned. It was the state of all those righteous and evil who died before Christ. Jesus went down to the just in hell who were awaiting their Redeemer so they could enter at last into the vision of God. And so the passage theme continues this idea of transit. Remember we introduced that week before last? We talked about the theme of journey or the theme of crossings from the, the Greek background and the Passover 
uh, which was called in Greek the crossing. This continues, this idea of transit, moving from the place of the dead into paradise, from Gehenna to Eden. So again, motion, movement, travel is that Passover idea. Now, verses, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 of 1 Peter says that Christ's suffering is an example to those who suffer in the body. The Christian lives against sinful desires. His readers have been delivered from them, have grown away from them. All right, we're going to have to bypass my six more pages of notes on that subject. And uh, we will finish up here chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, and here the judgment that Peter talks about continues the Agada. Chapter 4, verses 7 through 11, if you compare Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, again he explains the meaning. Verses 12 through 19 of the fourth chapter, Peter is encouraging his readers here not to be surprised by their sufferings, but to rejoice that they are participating in Christ's sufferings. In the Latin rite, at the preparation of the chalice, is the prayer. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. The mystery here is the paschal sacrifice, the emission of blood and water from the side of Christ, from which came forth frail humanity and restored humanity, the church. Chrysostom, again. There flowed from his side water and blood. Beloved, do not pass over this mystery without thought. It has yet another hidden meaning, which I will explain to you. I said that water and blood symbolized baptism in the Holy Eucharist. From these two sacraments, the church is born. From baptism, the cleansing water that gives rebirth and renewal through the Holy Spirit. And from the Holy Eucharist, since the symbols of baptism and the Eucharist flowed from his side, it was from his side that Christ fashioned the church as he had fashioned Eve from the side of Adam, Moses gives a hint of this when he tells the story of the first man and makes him exclaim, bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. As God then took a rib from Adam's side to fashion a woman, so Christ has given us blood and water from his side to fashion the church. God took the rib when Adam was in a deep sleep, and in the same way Christ gave us the blood and the water after his own death. Do you understand then how Christ has united his bride to himself and what food he gives us all to eat? By one and the same food, we are both brought into being and nourished. Chrysostom. And then a final word in chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Peter gives his exhortations to the presbyterois, the poimenois, and the episcopois, the priests, the pastors, and the bishops. Now, there is mention here, and we need to take note of it, chapter 5 and verse 4, of the archepoimenas, the archpriest, the high priest, who is Christ, the chief shepherd. But in giving his exhortation, his personal exhortation to the three ranks within the church, he gives to us what is classic encyclical language. The address is made here to the priests and to the pastors. And he also exhorts the neotroi, who are the neophytes, are these seminarians, who are to obey the presbyterois, the presbyters or the priests. So the young men in training for holy orders, inclusive, of course, of all the degrees of ministry leading up to holy orders are to take the direction from the priests. So here Peter exercises his authority and role as the sin presbyteros, the co-presbyter, and uh, as the supreme pontiff and pastor of the universal church. The conclusion then of the letter 
we return to where we began, composed with Silvanus or Silas and John Mark, his secretaries and his interpreters. Now this is important in a moment when we introduce the second letter of Peter. Because the Greek of second Peter, now I'm referring to the next encyclical, the Greek of second Peter is distinctly different from that of first Peter, indicating that the authors and editors are different. In our next letter, we'll look at the differences and the similarities between these two encyclicals. So we move on now to the material for Second Peter. This will be just introductory this evening, and uh, then we'll carry on and finish up, God willing, next week. But you see now why we needed four sessions, and we have only touched the surface of this. So let's look now at 2 Peter, which I have called partaking in the divine nature, which is really touches on the subtitle of our series. So we have here 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and uh, 2, and let's just read that. Shimon Kepha, Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith as precious as ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So here we have the customary greeting. The author is called now by a different name. Turn back again to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. 1 Peter 1, 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. What's the difference here? What's he called? Simon. He's called Simeon or Simon. I called him by his Aramaic name, Shimon Kepha. So here he calls himself Simeon Petros Dulos. Simeon Petros Dulos, rather than Petros Apostolos. Simon Peter, servant, or even slave. Dulos, slave. Simon Peter, slave. Now, this reflects very much the Aramaic form rather than the Greek. It is more personal than professional. And this may indicate that Peter is writing in a context of acute distress. Uh, the formality is gone. And we have something very personal coming from Shimon Kepha, as he would know himself. Do you remember that very moving record of the death of blessed John Paul? What was he called at the time of his death? What was he called? Carol, right? He was called by his own name, right? Why? Because this is how he knew himself, so to speak. Something similar is happening here. In a time of acute distress, perhaps, he comes a, a little more closer to himself, Shimon Kepha. This is his phrasing of his own name, Simon Peter, the name that our Lord Jesus called him so deeply and so personally. Look at verse 14 of that first chapter. Since I know that my death will come soon, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Something here very, very deeply personal. Come, he says, sit down. Let me speak to you. My time is very short. Uh, I'm going to die. The audience that he speaks to in verse 1 and the second part of it, uh, he refers here to a faith as precious as ours. So you get the sense of the very deeply personal approach here that Peter is taking. Verse 2, 
his blessing. Grace and peace. He refers to the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. There's more of a personal touch here than 1 Peter. Now, verses 3 through 11, we're not going to read it for the sake of time. I'll leave you to read that afterward. But here is where Peter now begins to introduce this very powerful idea of the nature of the Christian, the Christian's nature, and of the Christian's participation in the divine nature. Just reading verses 3 and 4. His divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus he has given us through these things his precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become, here it is, participants of the divine nature. Participants of the divine nature. You know, I've noticed something over the years of ministry, and I often comment on this, that as we grow older, uh, is there anyone here who's growing older? <laughs> is that is something? Yeah, you have, uh, there's a few. There's a few. As we grow older, it seems to me, as our bodies become weaker, our souls seem to me to become stronger. Why is that? I think it's because we're drawing nearer to the eternal. We're drawing nearer to eternity. I know you're saying, you know, I've got a few more good years. I know that. And they should be very good years because there's some kind of a phenomenon. This is my own theory now. This is my own theory. Very dear friend of mine, priest uh, up in my diocese, was very ill at Easter. And we have three priests in, in my parish. He has two parishes in the country. So I offered to have one of his parishes for the Easter liturgies because we had surplus back at home. So I went over and uh, it was Easter. And uh, I was finished, it was in the sacristy, Mass was finished, and someone came running in with the cell phone and said, she had 911 on the cell phone, and she's telling me he's collapsed, he's unconscious, and we're making sense of the whole matter. Uh, an octogenarian had fallen over. As soon as Mass was over, I said, I gave them the blessing, you know, it's the long one, you know, the, the long blessing, and finished, greeted folks at the back, went right to the sacristy. It was country church, so I could walk outside back into the sacristy. <laughs> He goes over, right over the pew. And uh, because Father was ill, he didn't get the oil from the chrism mass to the church yet. So, Father, do you have any oil? I realized I have oil. It's in, my, it's in my glove compartment. I'm always prepared. So off I go for the, for the oil. And uh, I get out to the car, and I don't have my keys. I've got to run back. I find the keys. I had to find the keys in the sacristy, run back. You know, meanwhile, somebody's uh, moving on to eternity, and I can't find my keys. I get to the, I get to the oil, I get back in, he's, he's splayed on the pew. Uh, we're waiting for the, the ambulance to come, and of course, I've got, I'm all ready, I, you know, and I get the ritual book out, and boom, boom, and he comes to. And he opens his eyes, and he sees the oil coming straight at him, and he says, no, 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 no. <laughs> So they're not that bad. I'm fine. It's like that. And I'm zeroing in. It's too late. It's too late. I'm connecting. And I'm saying to him, it's for healing. It's not that one. <laughs> and he goes, okay, okay. Okay. And he was fine. He walked home. Uh, he walked home. But, but uh, he refused to go in the ambulance. And then the pastor told me later, he said, I'm sorry that happened to you. It's like the third or fourth time. <laughs> oh, this is a shtick. Uh, but, you know, I think when we, you know, when we draw closer, uh, we, we get a little clearer view. 
that eternity is on the horizon. So as we grow older and weaker in body, we seem to get stronger in spirit. I tend to think something like that is happening here with Peter. I think Peter is drawing close, just like we saw in verse 14. He's coming closer and closer to crossing. He's in motion himself, and he's beginning to draw us into that. And so now, not like 1 Peter. 1 Peter, a little stiffer, a little more formal. A bit like the rabbi at the end of the big table at the synagogue And this is the second first day of Passover. (laughs) Remember I told you there's two first days of Passover? This is the second first day of Passover, where it's usually, maybe, or oftentimes in the synagogue. And the rabbi is at the end of the table. I remember Rabbi Irving when I was a kid. I remember I was maybe five years old. I have my first memory of the Pesach in the shul where I went to Hebrew school. And I remember him at the end of the table, and I remember him standing up. He was a very short man. And I remember, I remember even being aware of that. He had such a presence, but he was a smaller man. And I remember him saying, tonight we are slaves in Egypt. And I believed him. It was, we are. We're slaves in Egypt. You know, we're no longer in Amherst, New York, in the suburbs. <laughs> I'm a slave in Egypt. I complete, the rabbi said it, and I believed it. So the, the, First Peter is a bit more like the formality of the rabbi at the Passover Seder in the synagogue. Now we're kind of at Peter as maybe Zadie, grandpa, at the table at home with the family. And we have maybe a a much more personable encounter with Peter as he begins to connect on this very deep and private level. So he speaks about the knowledge of God, Jesus our Lord. And we're hearing now Peter opening his heart in this way. Now, the Greek here is rough. It's not polished. First Peter, good Greek. Okay, so college level Greek. First Peter, okay? Second Peter, eighth grade level Greek. That's an observation. That's not criticism. Why? Because where did Shimon Kepha come from? Where did he come from? The uplands, right? He, he, he came from Galilee, from Kinneret. And uh, what did he speak as a little boy? He spoke Aramaic at home and Hebrew at school. So he's taught himself Greek. Now, he probably, he, he might have been bilingual to some extent, being the fisherman that he was, and he was a successful one. We have Peter's house, as I showed you the first night, he was a successful businessman, and so he probably did business in some Greek. He had a little bit of Greek. He could bring that up maybe a little bit. So he's bearing his heart to us in his third language. So we're not going to be, we're not going to nitpick on the Greek tonight. And, and if, if you were doing that to his Greek, as you looked at it in the interlinear, shame on you. Uh, because I think what's very nice here for us is that we have coming to us now the Aramaic, the Hebrew heart, the Aramaic head coming through the Greek in a way that's much deeper. We don't have the interlocutor here, the interpreter, Sylvanus or John Mark. God blessed them. He needed them. He obviously used them uh, with their talents and gifts to be able to communicate more widely to the Hellenistic world. Second Peter, by the way, always had a rough go of it through the canonization process. Second Peter was left out of a number of the early compilations of the New Testament. Some questioned whether Peter was actually the author of it because they looked at the Greek and they said, this is rough stuff. Uh, Peter writes better than this. Look at first Peter. And they put 1 Peter there as the uh, standard and then compared 2 Peter to it. Well, I think that was totally misguided, if I might judge the first apostolic uh, and sub-apostolic church. (laughs) But I do think that uh, it was an unwarranted, and maybe that was because by that time, by the time the canon of the New Testament was being assembled, Greek was the language of the church. 
Greek was the language of the scriptures, Septuagint and New Testament. So when they came across this Greek, it was a little bit scandalous. It was somewhat embarrassing to have St. Peter having a rough go of it, composing his letter. But that's just fine with me because I think we have the Aramaic Peter. And why am I saying this? Because, once again, how he identifies himself. He uses his Aramaic name, Shimon Kepha, Simeon Petros. So that's what I think is going on here. And Peter is giving to us now really his final admonition, his final exhortation, his last missive that he's going to write to the church. And I think if we look back through the whole of sacred history, we look at the last admonition of Moses, the last admonition of Joshua, the last admonitions of Jeremiah, and so forth and so on. We can go through these. Elijah, we have them. We have these portions of them. These are very important. These are very, very important as they are today for us. Last communications before death. And Peter knows that death is impending, that he's going to die. And so he's giving to us this deeply personal exhortation which we have here. And he speaks now of this participation in the divine nature. And this we want to know all about. Uh, and that becomes the theme of his letter. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, number 460, quotes Saint Athanasius, for the Son of God became man so that we might become God. Let me read that to you again. Saint Athanasius. For the Son of God became man so that we might become God. What does that mean? That'll have to wait till next week. For tonight. Thank you very much, Father Shank. So we're going to take a very quick break, as we normally do. Come back in a couple minutes for Q&A. OK. Who's got a okay. question? Here's one. Yes, sir. When you spoke of Christ descending to hell, is that Sheol? Well, uh, of course, if we were to unpack the Hebrew, Sheol, correct, is the place of the dead. Many misunderstand this, and the Catechism pointed this out as being the place of the damned. It is not the place of the dead. Sheol in Hebrew is a very, very ancient word. It's one of the great challenges for translation, but we can get it in context as the place of the dead. And of course, we have Abraham. Jesus refers to this when he has the, the beggar, the poor man, Lazarus, who um, dies, and then there's the great gulf between them. So yes, that would correlate to show in the Old Testament. Yeah. Any other questions with regard to what we raised okay. tonight? Um, at the end of First Peter chapter 5, where it says, she who is at Babylon. Oh, yes. Is that like a church at Rome, or what is that? OK, well, there are theories about the reference to Babylon. And they range from, it's Babylon. Uh, Babylon was a Jewish center. In fact, at the time of the New Testament, Babylon was the rabbinical center of the world, not Jerusalem. Babylon was where the schools were. Babylon is where the Talmud was composed, compiled. But there is simply no evidence that Peter was ever there, that he ever went to the literal Babylon. Uh, the other theory is that Babylon is a code word for Rome. Why? Because it's the corrupt city under a ruler who considers himself God or a god. And the Romans in Rome, very sensitive about the way they were talked about. 
And so this would be internal code language. The believers would know that Peter was referring to Rome. Most biblical scholars who deal with the question uh, conclude that it is Rome. Although not all the fathers agree with that. The fathers of the church, some of them, some of them did suggest that it might be Babylon, but we just have no witness that he ever went to Babylon. She would refer to the church. Yeah, that wasn't unusual. Yeah. Was there another question? Wow. You bring up partakers in the divine nature and there are no questions. Everybody's being kind and waiting. <laughs> Until next Until week. Until the next session. All right. Well, then we'll just plan on seeing everybody else uh, next Sunday for the conclusion of Father Shanks. Thank you so much, Father. You're welcome. Thank and you. Thank you all for coming. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.